Okay, and we're live. Take it away, Mariana. Great. Hello, I am Mariana Islam, and I'm the Director of Programs and Advocacy at the Schott Foundation for Public Education. I want to thank you for joining our very special 25th anniversary celebration edition of our Grassroots Education Webinar Series, Addressing Classroom Bias to Improve Learning. I just want to very quickly cover a few important items to help us all engage in this conversation. So first, please feel free to use the chat feature, um, which is to post your questions. You can also tweet out your thoughts and questions to the Shot Foundation Twitter handle using the hashtag GrassrootsEd, and our Twitter handle is at ShotFound. We will use some time during the end of the webinar to get to some of your questions, as well as share links to pertinent resources. And lastly, we will also make this webinar available and shareable at the conclusion of this conversation. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Schott Foundation President and CEO, Dr. John Jackson. Thank you, Mariana, and thank all of you all for joining us today. Um, this webinar is the first of a six-part Schott 25th Anniversary Grassroots Webinar Series. The purpose of the series is not summing up the past 25 years at Schott, or placing the Schott Foundation in a good light as much as it is about continuing the work that Schott and partners have been doing to resource systemic campaigns and broad-based movements to accelerate the advocacy necessary to provide all students an opportunity to learn. For those who have yet to star in their own episode of Racism in America, I think you will agree that over the past couple of years, you've had an opportunity to at least see the movie trailers, if not a full mini-series. It is a fact that racism, sexism, and a host of other isms still exist in America. It is our hope through these webinars to provide a forum not to just discuss or point fingers at the individuals who personify the isms the most, but to accelerate the advocacy that allows us to make the personal political and move from the individual to the structural bringing about the type of systemic change that impacts thousands whose opportunities to thrive are denied each and every day because of these isms. This work is much bigger than any one individual or institution, definitely much bigger than the Schott Foundation. But it's what, thankfully, many of you take on daily. The work of other philanthropic partners also have, that have annually worked to, to address these issues like the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and their racial equity and racial healing work, Atlantic Philanthropies and their commitment to reforming school discipline policies, the California Endowment, Casey, and a host of others. The short of it is, it takes us working together, sharing our resources, and strategizing together to do this work. That's why we're excited about this webinar series, having all of you with us and our guests and subject matter expert today, exploring ways to address classroom implicit bias to improve student outcomes. Now, before we say, I, I knew it, those teachers are just biased, all of us have some level of biases in us. And most of us bring our biases into our personal and professional space. So this conversation is less about pointing out Mr. Johnson as this weird person, and more about understanding how do we put in place the trainings and systems where structurally individual biases are not concretized systemically and impede us on a host of student opportunity or on a host of student opportunities to learn measures or impede student opportunities to, to thrive. So let me get out the way and let's get the show rolling. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Philip Goff, who is the co-founder and president of the Center for Policing Equity, which works collaboratively with law enforcement, school communities, and political stakeholders to identify ways to strengthen relationships with the communities they serve. Dr. Goff is a nationally recognized leader in contemporary forms of racial bias and discrimination, as well as the intersection of race and gender. gender. His work and research has helped to inform work on the national level, including the members of Congress, congressional panels, Senate press briefs, and White House advisory councils. And more importantly, he's just a great guy. Schott supports the Center for Policing Equity's work to address implicit bias in the classroom. We will use this hour to explore the latest research and insights on policing and implicit bias in schools, sketch out new paths for restorative practices, and discuss the type, the kinds of policy reforms needed in schools and communities to make school discipline reform a reality. 
So with no further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Philip Goff. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here, and thank you all out there beyond the camera lens of my laptop um, in the cyberspace for joining us as well. Um, <clears throat> what I was asked to do today was to talk a little bit about uh, the research that the Center for Policing Equity has been doing, the broad psychological science of bias in schools, um, and do that from the perspective that we're coming from at CPE that began in policing. But I think probably the best way to do that is, is A, to leave a lot of time at the end for questions, because no one has ever said um, <clears throat> that a professor spoke for a sh too short a period of time. Um, but also to sort of give you a little bit of an origin story um, about how I got into this work, um, because it begins with my experiences needing to find language for things um, in, in my own high school. Um, so when people ask sort of how did I get into this, um, what was my, my entree both to policing and to studying the psychological science of bias, I have to start in high school. Um, I, had, I was moving into uh, the capstone English course in my high school. Um, I had there uh, a professor or a teacher who was beloved by many of my other colleagues or my, my, my peers. But when I walked in, because um, I had some health issues when I, I first started, I had mono um, <clears throat> and I had had some bad shellfish. If you ever have the opportunity, go ahead and skip that particular ailment. Um, but I had them both at the same time, so I couldn't get to school. And when I did finally show up, um, it was incredibly antagonistic. I had no dealings with this teacher ever before. It was confusing to me. Uh, I didn't know what to make of it. I'd been a very good student uh, my whole life. Uh, I'd gotten strokes from teachers. wasn't a brown noser, but uh, I think that most of the teachers I had encountered appreciated the fact that I showed up to learn and I tried really hard. He didn't. Mostly at first, though, it just felt bad. All of a sudden, a really important identity for me had been threatened, um, <clears throat> and I, I didn't know how to relate not only to him, but to the other children at the school. That's when the three black faculty members at my school pulled me aside and said, we're so glad that it's you this year. We've had difficulties with this teacher ever since he was hired, and he's been picking on black students the entire time. But you, you're too strong a student for him to do that to. And I have to say I was gobsmacked. I totally didn't expect it. Because I had been taught, somehow I had picked up, that racism was a thing that stupid people in the South did. My parents were both from the South. They left, I assumed, to get away from the racists. And I wasn't going to be encountering that, though in subtle ways I had my whole life. And what that did for me was not only did it, did it wake me up, did I become woke in that process, um, but it also showed me that if you were not steeped in the language of race and racial oppression, if you don't have a, a language for engaging with it, you'll find yourself often having conversations where you lose the argument, even though you know in your heart of hearts there's something about it that, that wasn't right. And that need for a language to engage, that need for a language that made sense of the experience that alienated me from a, a school where I had been for 12 years, from peers that I had made for the majority of my life, the language for that was what I, I realized once I became an academic was lacking both in the social science and in the common parlance. Okay. So that's my way of introduction, how I started doing work on issues of implicit bias and identity threat. I care about social justice, so I was going to be in a criminal justice space because as I was coming up through graduate school, we were just starting to talk about mass incarceration. But policing was another set of happy accidents. I'm not going to take you down that road um, per se, but I will say that that's kind of the origin story of being in a place where you don't have the language for what's going on, discovering the need for that language, and the need to translate it into other spaces and public spaces. Um, and so that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> the organizing research question is not, how do I have language for my 17-year-old self? Um, though that's not unrelated. The organizing question is, what causes racial stratification? And can we use the language uh, and the, the science of psychology to figure out better uh, routes to address it? Now, the common answer to the question of what causes racial oppression, racial discrimination, racism, um, is a language that talks about contaminated hearts and minds. And if you think about it in our laws, in our casual conversations, you know, in our media, we talk about that. We need to not be ignorant about racial considerations, right? We need to open our hearts. Um, people are looking for tougher hate crimes uh, <clears throat> legislation. These things all reduce to a problem of character. 
And that makes sense if you look at our history. The iconic images of the civil rights movement are images where people's character is on full display. Um, either the virtuous character of those who refused to hit back, um, or the corrupted character of those who were more invested in keeping us separate than in building up a house together. So it makes sense that we might reduce it to that. And that pre presents a compelling story that unfortunately is belied by the science. Because as racial bigotry has gentled, until very recently it began running for president, um, <clears throat> it turns out that racial bigotry can decline significantly while <clears throat> racial inequality can persist. And so that idea that contaminated hearts and minds are really the core issue, right, the core element of the problem, hamstrings us when we see that racial prejudice can decline um, in the general population while racial inequality persists. How can we possibly make sense of that? The way that psychological science should, at root, be able to help with that is with one of the core and most fundamental sort of learnings and lessons from all of the century of science that we've been doing, which is this. Attitudes are relatively weak predictors of behavior. Situations are much, much better. So I'm going to give an example from the science, and then I'm going to give an example that you can use as you're trying to explain this to other folks, and you can use to think, th to think through it. The example from the science um, is from a researcher named LaPierre, um, who traveled through to hotels in the South. Now, he was white, but he brought with him a Chinese-American couple, and they tried to rent a room in each of these Southern places in the, the mid-1930s, mid to early 1930s. <clears throat> Now, at that time, racial bias against Chinese Americans was certainly less virulent than against African Americans, but it was pronounced. It was out there. It was in the degree to which they had social media, which is flyers they would put up. Um, people went around and gave talks about it. So there was significant prejudice against Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants um, in the South and across America. To his great surprise, 97% of the individuals uh, or of the hotels that they went to rented rooms to this very polite, well-spoken Chinese-American couple. So when LaPierre went back to his uh, office, he then decided, let me make some phone calls. Well, it's actually part of the research process up front, but he said, let me make some phone calls to each of these places that I visited with this couple. Let me ask them what their attitudes are. Would they want to, would they be willing to rent to a Chinese-American couple? And 98% of those hotels said, absolutely not, under no circumstances would we rent to a Chinese-American couple. Now, were they lying? I think that that's, uh, there's a fair amount to say that maybe they're trying to self-present to the researcher, they maybe assume the researcher is white, this person who's calling is, is white, and they want to come off as, as good people with good morals, which at the time might mean we're prejudiced. But some of this is their honest attitudes. Um, and their attitudes just didn't predict their behavior when confronted with a well-spoken, polite Chinese-American couple. They just didn't want to be rude to them. And it turns out in the moment that their attitudes, their racial attitudes, weren't good predictors. Um, let me frame this a different way, though, because uh, that study, you kind of have to read it, go through it, it kind of makes sense, but maybe an easier one is this. Ask yourself, for all of you watching and anybody you want to you explain this to, do you know of anybody that you think of as a liar? I'll wait. All right. You've got that liar in your head. For those of you who are nodding really seriously like this, I understand you may very well be in a relationship with that person. It's not for me to judge. Um, <clears throat> but you have the idea of a person who's a liar. Now ask yourself this second question. Do they lie with every word that comes out of their mouth? The only people who are nodding their heads are currently dating that person, and you guys have your own issues to deal with. Everybody else understands that if someone lies with literally every statement, they, we would call them an opposite truth teller. They'd be the most reliable people we'd ever met. Nobody does that. So the people that we call liars are people who lie sometimes under certain circumstances. Well, what would those circumstances be? Well, a liar, says the science, usually lies when they're motivated to, when they think they can get away with it, or when they think that the consequences won't be too severe. Now, who do you think would, would also lie if they're motivated to, they think they can get away with it, or the consequences won't be severe? That's the category of, of everybody. 
So in fact, you're way better off knowing what someone's circumstances are than whether or not in their heart of hearts they're a liar. More than that, some of the people you think of as liars may just be people who are more chronically in those types of situations. So another way to quantify this is that attitudes, the things that we think that we believe, they predict about 10% of behavior at best in the general sense. Our racial attitudes predict about 10% of behavior at best. So they're weak indicators. When we think that we've, that we've got a handle of, on racism and racism really reduces to racist hearts or racist minds, contaminated hearts and minds, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice and that's what the science says as well. So as we move to talking about implicit bias, I want to broaden the lens a little bit. And for those of you who are a little bit new to, to ideas of implicit bias, it's that automatic association we have between two different concepts, two different targets. So for instance, if I were to say doctor, nurse, healthcare, sick bed, large bill, go back, think about did I use the word hospital? If you're not sure, that's normal. I didn't, but I used a whole bunch of words that we store in our brains really right next to the word hospital. And so our brains store information together. If we usually see um, <clears throat> things like hospital and big bill next to each other, we're going to grow to associate them. We do it automatically and under some circumstances that can also influence our behavior. Right? But note I said that contaminated hearts and minds are not the answer. We shouldn't reduce it to that. So we shouldn't reduce the problems of contemporary discrimination to reducing implicit bias inside the heads of people. Right? John said it very well at the beginning. It's not about who is and who isn't, who does and who doesn't have implicit bias. If we've all got it to various degrees, right, <clears throat> then really the question is what are the situations that are more likely to provoke behavior that's influenced by implicit bias? And if we look at the full range of psychological science, there's another thing we ought to be worried about, which is the science of self-threat to my self-concept. Right? <clears throat> Those things also influence our behavior, and they can end up ironically causing us to engage in behavior that ends up being discriminatory. So how do we refer to implicit bias and self-threats um, as one thing if we're talking about contemporary forms of discrimination? Well, in my lab and now in some other labs, we've started referring to that as identity traps. Okay? We call them traps because you can show up into a situation and the room is full of them. If you, anybody's ever been in a long-term relationship and you got a call from your partner and they say, honey, when you get home, we have to talk, you know you're not going home to flowers and a well-cooked meal. You know you're going home to a conversation about what you did wrong. And that's a trap because now you're anxious before you ever walk into the room. We're aware of them. And in the same way that implicit biases can influence what we see and how we behave, those self-threats can do the same thing. And I want to put an emphasis on those situations because the science says that's really powerful. Now, in my professional world, um, <clears throat> most of my research is on policing. And we look at how identity traps, both the fast traps, like implicit bias, and the slow traps, like identity threats, how those influence officer behavior. And as you've probably been reading for the last couple of years, unfortunately we're in a situation where we don't have a lot of publicly available data on that. So the Center for Policing Equity has been building something called the National Justice Database. The Shot Foundation has been helping us with that. Um, <clears throat> and that allows us to get access to actual behavior on, uh, actual data on police behavior. So we can look at what are the kinds of situations that influence otherwise well-meaning, you know, well-motivated, well-intended police officers to engage in behavior that we would consider to be discriminatory. And the trap stuff looks like it's a big deal in that. I'll give you an example. In Las Vegas, uh, <clears throat> we did uh, a, an intervention there because they had asked us to come in to look at use of force. We ha it happens all the time. We go, we take a look, we do an analysis, but in this place it was a little bit different. Before we ever even signed the contract, we saw that almost, well, 80% of their uh, use of forces that became problems for the department, they followed foot pursuits. Now, if you've ever gone on a foot pursuit, or if you haven't, I encourage you to go on a ride along. If you if you ever gone on one um, or haven't gone on one, you might think it's like the TV show where there's an old black cop who tackles somebody, and when they're done, they say, "I'm getting too old for this." That's not how foot pursuits usually end. They end when the suspect realizes that there's nowhere for them to go because as fast as you are, you can't outrun a radio, and they usually give up. 
Now, if the officer trailing behind, your adrenaline's high. Around any corner, somebody could be doing something dangerous. And by the time you catch up and put some handcuffs on this person, you're giving them a shot to the kidneys for the price of making you run. So the high adrenaline, the feeling like you don't have a lot of time, the presence of threat, that led to more identity traps, a, a bigger use of implicit bias or reliance on implicit bias, and a bigger reliance on identity threats and more discriminatory behavior. So in Las Vegas, we helped them craft a policy that said the first person who responds, since eventually they're going to be surrounded and they're going to give up, the first person who shows up and who's been running may not be the first person to put hands on them. And in Las Vegas, when they implemented that policy, we saw a 23% reduction in total use of forces across the board and 11% reduction in officer-related injuries. So that's how we go about doing it. Now, how does any of that relate to schools and teaching, educational environments? Well, probably some of you have already started making that link. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what CPE and other researchers have been doing um, to make the link a little bit more ex uh, uh, <clears throat> explicit. So in terms of fast traps, right, in terms of that implicit bias part, it turns out <clears throat> that places that have really strict rules and says this is exactly the policy, not just zero tolerance, but places that are really prescriptive, even those places that are prescriptive in terms of discipline, teacher discretion is a big deal. So whether the teacher believes that scrawling on your desk is just an act of being bored or an act of vandalism, it's going to make a big difference to a kid's life. That sense of a child being aggressive can be influenced by both fast and slow traps. And if you're in a classroom where you don't feel like you've got proper resources, don't feel like you're well-skilled at keeping the, the classroom under control, it's likely to lead to more stereotypic, consistent perceptions of the kids. That is to say, if I'm in a room and I don't know how to control it, or I worry that I don't have the resources, I'm frustrated having a bad day, I have to make a quick decision, I'm much more likely to discipline a black as opposed to a white child. That's those fast traps, that implicit bias. I don't have to believe that black people are worse, or that black children are less educated or less wonderful, but in those situations, which are pretty common across schools in the United States, and disproportionately targeted in, in more vulnerable communities, in those situations, I'm more likely to end up being more biased. What about those slow traps? Well, there's some great research uh, by Jennifer Randall Crosby and Benoit Monet um, talk, talking about the mentor's dilemma. Okay? And in this situation, if I'm a teacher, I happen to be white, and a black uh, student comes up to me with their schedule, the courses they want to take right now in this semester, what would I do if the schedule is obviously too difficult for any student? Right? They've got three chemistry classes that are all right next to each other and all different. They've got two physics classes that are being co-run at a college. They've got phys ed um, <clears throat> right in between all of those things. They're going to have to shower. Um, and then they've got an advanced poetry course. What do I do if there's just too many credits and it's just too hard? Well, it turns out in that situation, many of the teachers that they surveyed were really concerned. I think if I tell you it's too hard, you, the black student, you're going to think I'm telling you that because I'm racist. So what would happen is they would tell the white students, don't take that, that's crazy. Nobody could do well there. And the black students, they'd say, if you feel like you can, go ahead. It's this ironic thing where now black students, having been given the okay from an advisor, from a teacher, are set up to fail in a way that white students were protected from, not because the teacher didn't like the black student, but because the teacher was concerned the mentor was concerned about what would happen if they gave what felt like maybe negative feedback to that student. It's a way a slow trap can work. So what I want to I want to give to you sort of as the take home of all of this, we've talked about situations a lot. If you are a teacher in a classroom, if you're an academic administrator, if you're an advocate around this, if you, even if you're just a parent, the thing that you can do, the concrete thing you can do is Look at the risk factors for identity traps in your child's classrooms. Okay? The risk factors are things like, are the teachers and the students going to be distracted? Are they going to have to multitask? Okay? That's a risk factor. Um, <clears throat> do the teachers feel as if that they've got the ability to control the room without needing to rely on outside resources? Because that's a risk factor. Are the teachers experienced or do they have the opportunity for mentorship along the way in their professional development? because that's a risk factor. Right? <clears throat> also, are they motivated to be equal? Is that an explicit value? 
And are there social norms that say, we're going to try not to discipline a child because taking a child out of school is one of the worst things you can do for their long-term achievement? All those things are risk factors. And from any perspective on, on the educational system, if you're aware of that, if you're vigilant towards it, and you're working to reduce it, you're also working for equity. These make classrooms better across the board, so there's not a risk you're going to help some kids and hurt others. But mostly, you're particularly helping the kids that are most vulnerable while they're there. My hope is that makes some sense. Um, so as I said, I don't want to be talking for the entire time we've got. Looks like we've got about 35 minutes left, and my hope is that there'll be plenty of time for questions. But I also hope that I've left you with some concrete things you can do and a different way to think about how bias works, not just in education, but in all aspects of our lives. So with that, I'll stop the semi-formal portion of this, um, and I'll open up for questions. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Phil. You've given us a lot to uh, digest. Um, I think I'll start off the uh, round of questions. If I heard you correctly, I heard you say that, yes, we all have some level of implicit, implicit bias in us, and there are different triggers based on various situations. Based on that, can you help us understand how individual bias becomes structural in nature? Unless I also hear you saying that a group of teachers all have the same triggers. Um, so you do hear me saying the second thing as well. Um, so in terms of uh, somebody's level of implicit bias, we would, we would call that a risk factor too. If someone's really high in implicit bias, they're more likely to fall into the traps. Um, but if you take a bunch of people who are relatively low in implicit bias and you tax them mentally, you make them multitask, you put them in a situation that's novel and they haven't been trained for, um, and you tell them it's okay to treat people any old kind of way, relatively quickly, those low bias people are going to end up doing way worse towards their students and treating their students way less fairly. So it's not that implicit bias aggregates. Uh, that's not the, the most direct way to think about it. Rather, organizations and settings have rules, they've got policies, they have structures that get set up that are race neutral on their face but that produce racially disparate outcomes. And that's how we can think about a structural component to implicit bias. It's the policies, settings, and culture that make it more likely that everybody who's got them is going to be relying on them in those situations. Does that make sense, John? Yes, it does. Well, I have more questions, but I want to be uh fair and open it up to the larger discussion. So Mariana, can you set us up to pull in some questions, some other questions? Great, and we have some great questions coming in. Um, this first question, or this next question is, are you addressing the impact of media and negative image portrayal in your work? Um, <clears throat> so, I didn't go into great depth about the research that we're doing. We're mostly trying to focus on outcomes. Because uh, that's how the behavioral outcomes, that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, <clears throat> and when we're looking at the causes, we're mostly looking at the local ones, the proximal ones. So we look at implicit bias of teachers. We look at implicit bias um, and the identity uh, threats of, of uh, law enforcement, of parents, and of the other peers. Um, but if I can make an assumption about what might be behind that question, um, basically what is the role of mass media and also social media in this, it is profound. None of us could, would come up with stereotypes about groups if we weren't exposed to social representations. Now, it used to be social representations were print media or stories that our parents or older folks would pass down to us, but now those social representations are almost cast in, in titanium um, and given to us through the iPads that we have entertaining us in the crib. Um, <clears throat> so we don't focus on that very much, but the people who are sort of more basic um, implicit bias researchers have demonstrated that uh, these automatic associations can start um, as early as two or three. Um, they really are getting them in the crib. Um, and it, unless there's a concerted effort to change the social media and other sets of social representations people have access to, so their personal contact, they get really hard to move around over time. The good news is you don't have to change the automatic association the trap or the, the implicit bias in order to change the behavior. 
But the bad news is if you don't fix the structures and the actual level of justice in society, you're going to have a really hard time fixing the implicit bias. Great. And this next question um, is comes from the Dignity in Schools campaign, one of our partners um, who's working to um, end the school to prison uh, pipeline. And so the question is, from a system-wide level, what policies, training, and practices would you recommend for a school system to implement? And I know that's a big question. Yeah, let's say, go ahead and start me real small. Um, <laughs> how do we fix racism? And three easy steps. Um, it's a great question, uh, <clears throat> or a great series of questions. Um, let me take it off and break it down into a couple of different pieces. Uh, there are people in this space that focus in on training. There are people in this space that focus in on policies um, and focus in on uh, awareness raising and education of these issues. Uh, all of that work is important. I would say that for me, the biggest piece to it, to it. Is, is the policy piece. Um, and the uh, reason and is trainings, trainings are like... Oh, and I'm starting to get oh, an echo, echo here. So, <clears throat> Mariana, can I ask you to, Mariana, to mute ask you yours? yours? See if that works for me? That works for me? Sure. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, trainings are a great way for an organization to communicate its values. It's important. So, trainings that would let teachers know and let parents know that implicit bias is a real thing, um, that procedural justice, the need to be fair in order to get compliance with authority is a real thing, um, that identity traps, so not just implicit bias, but self-concept. That's a great way to let parents know that their kids are going to be safe and to let teachers know that you take this seriously. But it's not great as great at changing behavior. So you can communicate values that way, but if you really want to change behavior, change the incentive structure Right? and change what people are told to do. I'll give you an example in Toronto, and I hope I've got the, the numbers memorized right. Toronto Police Services used to pull over um, or, or stop uh, in pedestrian stops 7,000 people every week. That may seem like a lot to you, depending on where you're living. It may seem like not a lot if you're with me in New York, um, but 7,000 people per week. They, they changed two things. Um, after there was concern about civil rights violations there, they said, all right, um, when you pull somebody over, you, you have a conversation, you say, hey, I need to talk to you. You need to give them a card that, give, that has your badge number and an explanation of what their rights are and how to complain if their rights were violated. And the second thing is the number of times you pulled somebody over or you stopped somebody could not be considered in your promotions. They went down to 256 people stopped per week. If you want to change behavior, change the incentive structure. Right? <clears throat> and you make it you do that in part by making people accountable to specific numbers sometimes. So and another example, my good friend Jack DeVideo at Yale um, has this wonderful study that he did, wasn't allowed to publish it because it was with the Department of Defense, but he talks about it everywhere he goes, where there was huge racial disparities in promotions in the US military. And they had concerns. So they called a social psychologist in, right? That's what you should do if you have a concern about something. Um, and he said, well, one thing we could try is if you are under-promoting, so if the percentage of people you promote is lower than the, the racial demographics uh, in the field, all you've got to do is explain why. No punishment, no nothing bad, just explain why. As soon as they implemented the policy, there was exact parity of promotions for the entire length of the policy. New president gets in, uh, new director, uh, uh, or, yeah, director of personnel for, for the Army and for Armed Services, for Joint Chiefs, and they take it away, goes right back to the original level. Um, so that's that's sort of how I would I would start thinking about it. That was a long answer. I'll, let me get a shorter answer for the concrete specifics of what you should be focused on. Um, I think it's best as we're learning about this stuff to work backwards from the outcomes um, that you care about. So if you care about um, out of school suspensions and expulsions, if you care about arrests, um, <clears throat> then look and see who is responsible for making those decisions, um, what degree of of discretion they've got. Start working backwards from there. So it may be that the arrests are happening because police are called, and there's they don't have a choice about whether or not to arrest the student once they're called. That means it's with the teachers making those referrals or making those calls. So you start with the teachers. You say, how do we incentivize a different set of outcomes for this? And obviously, you want to do it in a safe way. You want to do it in a way that respects the dignity of the people who are making the decisions. But if you start there, 
that's going to be the I think the best way forward. And I wish there was sort of a, a one size fits all. Maybe if I get another question, I could do a couple of the best practices. Um, but right now, I think it's really important that we do real focused practices and policy changes as we move through this. Great. And so a follow-up question to that is, um, can you give some more specifics of how um, how we might change the incentive structure for teachers to reduce suspensions? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so mm -hmm. you know, I'll ask you to, I'll ask you to, uh, to mute yourself if you can. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we work with, with schools that have decided that one of the ways that they're going to be evaluating teachers for um, raises, for special recognition, is they're going to add an equity or civil rights component to it. Um, and some departments have gone, uh, or some school districts have gone way beyond where we thought uh, was possible initially. So first, they track suspensions. And they're looking to see, all right, given the number of students you got, and given the sort of success level, and the, the amount of trouble they get in elsewhere, are you suspending and expelling students, you the teacher or the vice principal who ends up adjudicating it, are you doing that in a way that's fair? Um, and f measuring the fairness is hard, um, but, but once you say that you're going to be doing that, it's hard for the teachers to push back, except on, well, how do you measure that? And they kind of get it. You can also promote. These people have had the lowest levels of, sus of suspensions and expulsions. Um, uh, you, you give them some recognition and ask them to talk about that experience. Right? Uh, we find that positive recognition turns out to be a really good thing that, uh, that can happen. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, have encouraged departments, uh, we're sorry, I keep thinking of departments because I usually work with police, but uh, school districts um, <clears throat> to reach out to other school districts and set up competitions for it. Um, they have uh, for lowest numbers of, susp of suspensions. Uh, we've had uh, folks set up uh, sessions with, uh, <clears throat> with parents uh, where they review sets of suspensions and expulsions. Um, and again, I'm focused on that because that's frequently the thing people want to talk about. Um, but whether they review them with the parents and they get parent input on it, which I think is great. Saying, well, you know, if that were my kid, here's how I would deal with them. Um, and not just from the parent of that kid, because that can become incredibly emotional. You know, we mask it ideally, or we have it for a grade that's different than the grade where it actually happened. But parents have great wisdom in these areas. And it also builds a kind of understanding so that it becomes or it increases the role to which it's parents and teachers united helping the kids out. Um, so those are some of the examples that, that come to mind um, sort of most easily. And if I, if I get another question that pops another one in, I'll go ahead and, and relay those two. Great. This next question um, is from Sarah from the ACLU Racial Justice Program. She wants to know, how do you address the teacher multitasking risk factor while promoting classrooms that are inclusive? So by academic proficiency, disability, English language learners, et cetera. Okay. Um, um, sorry, Mariana, one more time. There, there we go. Um, and also, thank you, Sarah, um, for the question. Uh, if I can translate that into Phil speak, is how on earth, given the set of challenges the teachers have, do you address the multitasking issue? Um, just so you know, it's not any easier with police who are frequently, if they're patrolling in a car, they're driving, they're listening to a radio, they're also usually listening to one or two phones, they may be on a radio making a call, um, and they've got a computer there that's giving them real-time information while they're scanning the neighborhood. How anybody's able to do that and not crash every day, I have no idea. Um, and teachers are in not much of a better situation. Um, but I do think it's the case, if you look at the, the school districts that have more money, um, private schools and places that are able to be successful, the teachers have less to do. So in the same way that I often advocate that we shouldn't have police doing social work, I don't think it's fair that we have teachers who are also essentially you know, extended officers of public safety. Um, so one way to address it is structural, is that you've got to find ways that public school teachers, particularly in the most distressed areas, are not tasked with doing all of those things at the same time. And or you try and find ways to give more money so you get special screening to get people who have the kind of talent that that's not as depleting for them. Um, but there's no, there's no simple trick in a classroom to make it easier to be a teacher. That's why so few do it and so even fewer do it well. That's a super unsatisfying answer. Mariana, quick, ask me another question so I can be useful. <laughs> okay, this next question is, how do we go from merely avoiding traps to removing, removing people's susceptibility to the traps? Okay. Um, okay. Um, how do we move from uh, avoiding uh, to removing their susceptibility? 
So I don't usually talk about avoiding the trap so much as I talk about diffusing and disarming them. Um, I'll go back to the, the instance of, hey, maybe we got to talk. Um, for those of you who have had this happen to you more than once, you might, in fact, have a tried and true mechanism for diffusing the trap. Um, the most common among people when I do trainings is you come home with flowers, right? You come home with takeout from the favorite restaurant, or you come home with a worse day. You know what? This happened, and then this happened, and I'm so frustrated. Yeah, wait, did you have something you wanted to talk to me about? Yeah, maybe, maybe it can wait, right? So those sets of things are ways to diffuse it. None of them, by the way, end up, have ever worked for me. If I'm in trouble, I'm just in trouble. Um, <clears throat> but you find ways to engage with it so that the trap is not, no longer activated. If you want to reduce somebody's susceptibility, susceptibility to it, you got to either remove the traps from the room or you need to make a society that's actually just. The reason why people associate black folks with crime is in part our no like nightly newscasts are biased in how they put things out. It's in part that our, our entertainment media has been terrible in perpetuating those stereotypes. But it's also in part that people in urban settings who don't have access to the resources necessary for uh, social uh, mobility are going to be more likely to be involved in underground economies. Those folks are going to be committing crimes. If you stop the structures that make crime more attractive in some neighborhoods, you'll stop associating crime with those neighborhoods. Um, so there's, there's, there's not a training that reduces implicit bias forever and ever that can withstand watching 15 minutes of your local nightly news. Um, <clears throat> and there's not really going to be. There's, I mean, somebody maybe can invent a microchip, um, but I, I don't want to live in that society. So uh, there's not a simple solve to that, unfortunately. Sorry, Mariana, you're still on mute. Sorry about that. So can you talk about the so, excuse me, the proximity to other cultures and the active stance individuals need to take to counter implicit bias? The proximity, the proximity to, other cultures, to other cultures and the active stance that people need to, um, <clears throat> to adopt to fight this stuff. OK. Um, so in social psychology, that proximity issue, the amount of, of you know, so social and cultural inter interplay you have, that's called the contact hypothesis, that if you have more contact, you'll have less, less bias. And I can say that that is a complex but robustly kind of true thing. How's that for a strong endorsement? Um, and here's what I mean by that. You have to engage with people as equals. Right, so if I have a lot of contact with, with folks of a different group, but they're always emptying my garbage or they're cleaning my car or something like that, that's not going to reduce prejudice. So you have to be on equal footing. Um, you need to have shared values articulated. That's going to help. Um, <clears throat> and it needs to be relatively free of, of conflict and relatively free of self-censoring. I don't know how often that happens. So you need to be real friends with a real equal for this to, to have the biggest uh, uh, influence. Now, if you're living in, a, in an integrated space, there's better chances of that. If your kids are going to a school um, that has diverse demographics represented, there's a much better chance of that. But contact is usually not enough. And in fact, what I like to say is integration is a necessary precondition of segregation. Right? Most parts of Idaho aren't very segregated because there's not very many different demographics of people living there. So <clears throat> contact's not enough. It does help, though, when you have strong social norms either in your household or at your school about what tolerance and inclusion looks like, right? And if you've got good, firm, yet kind and understanding words about why some kind of behavior and some kind of language, which is in fact frequently a kind of behavior, that's not going to work here, right? If you can explain it in a way that's clear, that's fair, but that's also firm, um, that helps tremendously. Okay, this next question is from Marlon Tillman from Gwinnett Stop. What suggestions do you have to help school systems understand the need for ongoing anti-bias training and accountability in the anti-bias policy implementation? All right, suggestions, All right, suggestions. for helping um, school districts understand that they need to keep doing this. You know, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, which is what people say when they're stalling for time because they don't have a great answer to it. It's one of the things that happens. Um, uh, and, and that's the truth here. So we've worked at it because um, we've worked in school districts where sometimes actually the teachers union is the biggest pushback. They'll say, yeah, 
um, you're trying to find ways to fire our teachers and, and revoke tenure. I mean, teachers are under siege right now in certain ways, um, so I understand it. Um, but other places, there'll be a court order, or there'll be parents that want something, and the school district is not really um, is not really excited about it. Um, some things that have worked for us, it it actually does help to have nerds on your team. And here's what I mean by that: when I go in and I talk to folks, I say, "Hey, um, we can help you address this by measuring." which you guys could do, but it's really, really hard, um, and some of the best people in the world are still trying to figure out exactly how to do that, we'll do the best that's possible, um, and then we'll try and work with you to craft some kind of solution to make things better. Now, I tell you that because it's pretty straightforward, but it has this magical effect because I am such a nerd, which is that it says implicitly to a school district, we all recognize this stuff is hard. And so if you haven't solved it yet, that's not a reflection on your character. And we also recognize it's going to take some time. So if we come up with something that doesn't feel real comfortable right away, it's actually okay for it to take a little bit of time for it to, to change. Um, for folks who don't think it's necessary because they've got it all the way solved, um, it's really not that hard to gather data or gather a couple of interviews from somebody in the school district and say, yeah, you know what, here's some evidence that you guys have some, fur some further to go. Um, again, a nerd can help here. Because I can say with great confidence, um, do you live on Mars? No. Then there's bias in your system. Um, if you want to convince me as a nerd, you better show me the numbers. And I guarantee they, they don't have those numbers. So having a process set up where a third party can sort of get people to the table, and even when there's traditionally adversarial forces, they can be a clean slate um, upon which you, know, you, can, you can place new expectations and new goals. So I like to say that um, you know, researchers and nerds can set the table where traditional adversaries can come together and form new solutions. Um, so those, those would be tactics I would encourage for you to use, but also a process um, which I think has been incredibly helpful in our experience dealing with school districts. Even when we're not doing research, sometimes just me sitting in a room is useful not because there's some great power to this beard, but because um, there is kind of a power to having a, an academic in the room who can make this not about you, but about them. Them being the kids. Them being the kids. Great. So um, this next question is, how is your research also informing the ways in which communities and schools are approaching, um, as Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term, the intersectionality of race, gender, and or sexual orientation? So it's a great question. It's one of my research passions is to be looking at race, gender, intersectionality in particular, um, and when it's feasible within a methodology, race, gender, and sexual orientation. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we work with Kim on that. Uh, I have to say, though, it's hard because of the way in which headlines frequently uh, guide school districts to be interested in things. So right now, everybody's interested in um, school resource officers and police uh, within school districts. Uh, they're interested in that because you have a couple of really high-profile incidents, and everybody's looking around saying, that could be us next, right? Just one bad incident, and all of a sudden, all kinds of bad things are going to get said. Um, <clears throat> and people are not interested in what's going on with, with girls, because um, even though a couple of those incidents have been with girls, somehow in the American uh, mind, it's not being coded as, well, it's, this is black girls that this is happening to, and that's different than black boys. Uh, so the research that we're doing right now is looking at the policing of femininity or appropriate femininity um, and how that leads to a different kind in, in category of a school to prison pipeline for girls than for boys. So I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> in California, in the juvenile uh, detention system, Nikki Jones has done some work which is just shocking to me, where greater than 50% of the girls in the juvenile um, uh, corrections and detention uh, facilities are either queer identified or gender nonconforming. That's not an accident. Some of that has got to be the difficulty adjusting um, and the, the difficulty with peer groups that like to pick on folks who are different, but some of that in some kind of way is the policing of femininity in a particular way. So we're looking at how that comes up and we, we're seeing it that girls who fight um, is somehow associated with girls who have girlfriends. I don't really know how that happened in law enforcement. I don't know. I can't trace the evolution. But we're hearing it consistently enough that we're, we're figuring out, trying to figure out 
how to set up projects that can measure that and provide some concrete solutions so that you don't end up there. Um, the other way I would think about it is, is like this. A lot of the high profile things having to do with policing um, have had to do with um, black and brown men. Okay? <clears throat> the reason that that's the case is because we're looking at the cameras. And the ways in which police abuse the rights of black and brown men is frequently going to be stuff that happens where cameras are available. Black and brown women are much more likely to be uh, have their rights abused when police are responding to a domestic uh, reported domestic violence, when they're responding to sex trafficking or sex work, or in a de detention facility. All of those places are places where there is no public, so there'll be no cell phone cameras, and body cameras by policy are and frankly should be turned off. So we've got a way of thinking about police uh, corruption and police reform that, frankly, privileges the experiences of black and brown men. When you know that, you, you try and go the extra mile and say, all right, what are the policies and what are the outcomes that are disparate and, and sort of most starkly disparate for the women and the girls? Um, and so what we're trying to do, in addition to looking at this policing femininity, is we're also trying to, to look for what those outcomes are um, sort of across the board um, so that we can start a, a better research program. The um, last part I'll say on this is these are really great questions and you're seeing me struggle with them a little bit. That's in part because this wasn't a field as of like two or three years ago. It's not an excuse for me. I'm just saying if you guys are looking for career changes or you know folks who want jobs, we're hiring because there's a massive need to know so very, very much um, and there's so little that's being done in this area because we've just decided to start paying attention to it. Great. So we're winding down our time now, but I'm going to um, ask one question, um, one last question, and you can take a little bit of your time on this. Um, we, we're part of a network of over 20,000 um, advocates, um, and a, you know, a lot of folks are have been working on this issue right for years um, in, in many different ways, um, and some making headway and um, others still struggling to even have the conversation, right? And so what would your advice be to the advocates and the organizers and, and to parents too, right, um, and, and students, um, so multiple audiences there um, in, in, in doing this work? So, you know, words of wisdom that you'd like to impart. Well, that's a heavy uh, mantle to give me. Um, I appreciate it but I'll struggle with this one too. Um, my experiences doing this kind of work, um, I, I think that the, the lessons that have come most stark to me is that the language matters a lot. How we talk about this stuff matters a lot. Um, and to the degree that we can wrap our minds around the idea that many of these failings, not all of them, because there's still bad people out there, but many of these failings are not faults in character, they're faults of human frailty in situations that are not set up to care. And it's hard to be mad at a situation, but it's sometimes easier to fix it because the situation doesn't have an investment in and of itself. So if, if I can sort of, from a methodological uh, perspective, give a recommendation, my first recommendation would be look for the situations and try and foreground those as opposed to the bad actors. Um, at least first, because the bad actors are going to come out regardless. But if you start with, let's identify the situations to make it better, the folks who might not be bad actors but are really scared of being told that they are, they're more likely to be on your team. And that would be the second thing that I would say, is that interest convergence here is relatively high. There's not a lot of police officers, believe it or not, in the world who join because they really just want to beat up black and brown people. Very, very few folks that do that. And in the same way, there's not a lot of teachers um, who decide that that's their profession because they said, you know what I really want to do is increase racial hierarchy. That's not a, really a thing. There are some teachers who I have met who have, have that as a goal, but they're rare, and they're as rare as the police officers. What does happen, though, is they show up in an under-resourced place um, without a structural sense of what the heck is going on, um, and they just say, I am doing this the best way I know how, with very few resources, and now you're telling me I'm doing it wrong. And that's a scary thing for them, and it's a threatening thing for them, and it's a human thing that it would be. So to the degree that you can engage collaboratively and say, and appeal to the, the best interests and the values of those folks, 
um, you're able to sort of disarm some of the things that are in the way. Because for me, the biggest impediment to the political will of getting these things done is that there are folks who aren't sure whether or not a project of reform is also a project of indictment of their character. Right? And then I guess to the degree that we can sort of go way off topic here, this kind of work is soul crushing. It, it can really take a toll on all aspects of your life. Because even when you're successful, it's, it feels like it's incremental. Um, and, you know, people say, well, if I, if I touch one child, then I've done my job. But if you just touched one, that's a lot to invest your whole life into, especially if you don't know which one it is. So I, I would say that one of the things that's kept me able to do this is that I have a team of some of the most amazing people I've ever met. Um, and we routinely serve as social support in addition to professional support. So invest in the relationships of the teams of people who are doing this. I mean, I, I'm saying things that all of this feels presumptuous because everybody out there doing this work, you know, you guys have been doing it for as long, many of you longer uh, than I have. You know, we've just had different experiences. But if that's not a thing that that you've invested in, that you've made part of the structure of your work, I, I can't recommend it enough. If I couldn't pick up the phone and call somebody from Center for Policing Equity um, when I got new information that a little boy had his, has his face bruised and broken so badly he won't see out of one eye because he didn't like how the police were talking to his mom. If I didn't have somebody um, who I said, hey, it's been a rough day, you know, here, here's what's happened to this, this sex worker in this, in this city, um, or here's what's going on with this teacher um, and how their lack of resources made them sort of feel they had to behave. You're just not of use to the things that you care about. So, I mean, maybe the best piece of advice I ever got when I was uh, in undergrad, when I was in college, um, I had a really impressive professor who, for reasons surpassing all understanding, took a real interest in me. And I walked in one day, and I, I was saying, look, I, I'm not really clear-headed. I think this, and I feel this, but it's just my opinion. It's not something I really feel like I can stand behind. And he got, like, upset with me. He put his hands on him. He said, Phil, you are important to the things that you care about because only you are going to be doing that particular contribution. Um, and what that's meant to me in my adulthood is to make sure that I have structures of support for me and the people around me um, so that we can keep doing it because we, we don't do it for the fame. Um, we don't do it for the recognition because even professionally we don't tend to get a lot of recognition for it, um, even in the social justice circles, and we sure as heck don't do it for the money. Um, we do it because the work is more important than um, the things that we suffer from. But if you don't have, if you don't have that backdrop and that backstop, that support, it's hard to keep doing it. How's that? That was, that was great. Great. I just want to step in and say thank you, Phil, today for sharing so much thought leadership. I was on mute, but you had your amen corner over here. So thank you for your thought leadership, your analysis, and really your lifetime commitment. And also thank you for the relationship advice. Um, and we hope to continue to work with you. And to those who joined us today, I want to thank you for join, joining us. Um, and I ask that you join us also next month for a new discussion, new subject matter expert, and new thinking around ways that we can put in place the policies and practice that provide all students a fair and substantive opportunity to learn. So we are done for, the, for today. So I'll just say to you, let us keep learning, let's keep fighting, and let's keep loving one another. Have a great afternoon.